and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher. This is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Chris Ward. She's the author of Win the Hour, Win the Day, Time Management for Small Business, a four-week productivity plan to go from overwhelmed to highly efficient and reclaim your life. And in this conversation, we talk about time management principles that anybody can understand easily and apply. And these are principles that Chris has used with her clients so that they would have more time, more freedom, more joy, and more fun as they worked inside of their business. So if you'd like to take a sneak peek inside of those systems, those processes, those principles, enjoy this conversation with Chris Ward. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show, Chris Ward. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you. You have a new book out called Win the Hour, Win the Day, Time Management for Small Business. And it's not just about small business. I mean, this is this is honestly one of the most practical, personal productivity books that I've seen out there. And you actually kind of go into that in the subtitle of a four-week productivity plan to go from overwhelmed to highly efficient and reclaim your life, because that's what it's really all about. Whether it's about the business or your life, it's all about being efficient, effective, productive, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And enjoying the ride. For sure. I So here's the thing. I just got back from podcast movement. I went uh, last week and so many great podcasters and, you know, met a lot of people that listen to the show as well as met a lot of people that uh, said, oh, what's your podcast about beyond the to-do list as they'd read it off my name tag. And I would talk to them about, about what it's about. And then they'd be like, OK, so I got a question for you. Like, what's the best to-do list app for me to use? Or, uh-huh. you know, and, and I would get all these uh, kind of softball productivity questions. And it really all boiled down to it's circumstantial. Like, tell I would have to ask them questions like, OK, tell me where you're struggling. Tell me about what it is that you're stuck on kind of things. And so it's all personal. It's all practical. It's all contextual. And you know what? I would even sit, go dive deeper than that. I would say, here's the thing. The tools are not going to solve your problem. You need to have some fundamentals in place. It's like a microphone will not make you a better speaker. You'll just be heard louder. So when people ask me that, what's the best app? Yeah, there are time saving tools out there. But if you don't have the infrastructure in place, then, you know, that's just a, 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 an enjoyable distraction. I'd love to get a little bit of context here. So we all have an interesting backstory. You have a unique, interesting backstory. I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about that. Walk us through where you were at prior to this book. So I have a branding and marketing agency and I was in business for about four years and I was just, I stopped one day and I looked around and I thought, I am working crazy hours. I had all these ambitions that I wanted to get out for my company and for my clients. And I just looked around one day and I thought, I can't keep this up. And I nearly electrocuted myself. And I talk about this in the book because I was in such a rush. And now I call myself a recovering rushaholic. But anyhow, and I had subscribed to the old way of doing things where your personal life pays the price, where you're working harder and harder, buying new technology, burning out, repeating the cycle. And I realized it wasn't working. So I decided to make a change and I started to feverishly examine productivity and I didn't have the time for time management systems. I needed something that would give me big results with minimal effort. And I got a lot done in a day. And so for me, there was a big pushback like time management. I get a lot done, but I needed something even bigger. So I was determined to make productivity my superpower. And I really dove all into that. And luckily I did because a few years later, my husband was diagnosed with colon cancer and I had been pulled away from my business. And I was away for almost two years, really. And when I returned after he passed away, my clients were shocked. They had no idea of my absence. They didn't know anything about what's going on. When his, his death became public, it was a real surprise to people that worked with me. They just, they, you know, so they had no idea. So they started to gently ask me, you know, how did I run in such efficiency? And so I do love helping people. And I, of course, I had a renewed sense of what's important in life. And, and I really wanted them to enjoy their life and their business. And it really helped me in the grieving process. So 
it was amazing. I was able to help them turn their lives around and eliminate 80% of their to-do list, 100% of their guilt, stop doing things that they didn't want to do or hated doing and that they weren't good at, and really get their dream projects out and started, you know, adding on services they always wanted to get to, creating new revenue streams, you know, all the while going to their kids' soccer games and really, truly, for the first time ever, leaving their business behind and taking real vacations. And this was all done with a real easy and permanent fix. And I took all those successes and thought, you know what, I want to help more people. So that's with all the stories I had and all the sort of the things that we did together with me and my clients, I thought, let's write a book so that more people can really love their business. Cause I think business should be fun and life should be more fun. And so I just wanted to get, you know, I, I wanted people to understand that grind that's old school and you don't have to do that. You don't have to trade in your life for your dreams. And that's how the book came about. Chris, thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm encouraged to hear your story because not only is it an awakening of sorts, but it's also, you know, pushing through, basically tragedy and coming out the other end, still moving forward and thriving and that that's what you're encouraging and revealing is possible for others to do. Well, you know, life happens and things when people would sort of bestow too much, almost I'd say sympathy upon me, I would say to them, you know, everybody has something. This is my something right now. So I do think we all have uh, difficulties in our road. And what I want your business to do is to support your life, not consume it. And so I had the comfort of being very present uh, with John and, you know, putting little surprises in place and making those last memories very impactful for him. And he was a huge fan of mine, my biggest fan ever. And really, he saw how hard I worked on the business. And he thought for a moment that it was suffering, like he would have been devastated. So I could calmly say, no, no, it's being handled. And I I didn't always believe that I was surprised myself at my (laughs) success. But, but, you know, I wouldn't have needed that extra weight. And he certainly would that so it's, it's also, let's be practical for a minute you know, on a less sensitive road, I lost an income. So if I come back to a business gutted and devastated, and now, you know, I don't have the financial means to support myself, it stressed my ailing husband. That's just not where you want to be with business. So it it, it is why not enjoy the ride and, and be as successful as you want to be without, you know, compromising your life. But if there is an interruption, you need that business to support you. It, it should be a strength, not a, a hindrance. This was your thing. I've had my things. Listeners are thinking about, you know, what are the landmark milestone things that have happened in their lives that have changed them in ways they may not even fully understand uh, yet, but are still unpacking. But in the end, all of those different experiences are what you draw upon as those moments where you sit and you reflect Uh, sometimes while you're during the process, sometimes after, but they always kind of distill you down into making you pay attention and have you decided what your prioritized things in life are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would love to get into what does the title of the book mean for you? How do you interpret that? It's called Win the Hour, Win the Day. What does winning the hour and winning the day look like or mean to you? Well, what I say is if you can win the hour, you can win the day. And so really what it's about is reorganizing your day for maximum results because a successful plan will always, you know, win over hard work or discipline every time. So what I like people to do is really look at their day. And I think that what happens is we all dive into the day with, you know, too much enthusiasm and uh, and not a plan, right? Like I know for myself years ago, I would hit Monday morning, like somehow Monday was going to be this big, long day that was longer than any other day. And I had my mighty to-do list in my hand and I would just start, you know, going as fast as I can and try to check everything off that to-do list. But what happened was I didn't realize that item number five might take two hours. Item number six might take two days. I didn't know. So then that dumps to the next day and you beat yourself up and you think, well, I have to start earlier and stay later. And it's just, you know, a spiral downwards really desperate and quickly. and, And it's just exhausting. So what I really challenge people to do is look at your hour. So what do you do that first hour? For starters, most people dive into their emails. And that's, I mean, we can do a whole podcast on why that's problematic. So what I would say to you is do your creative work first, 
in the day because your battery is fully charged. You don't have decision fatigue. You don't have, you know, uh, attention residue. You've got all these things that work against you as you move through the day. Because I used to leave any learning I had to do because there's always something we have to learn or learn do new or a new project. And I would leave that to the end of the day thinking, well, when my work is done, I will get to that. So it's really, there's fundamentals about reorganizing your time and understanding where your time is. Like that's a time bank account. Your calendar shows you how much time you have. And when people aren't putting stuff on their calendar because they think, oh, I do this every day. I don't need to put it on my calendar. It's not an appointment. I know I have to do it. That's very similar to saying, well, I know my car payment and my phone bill comes out of my bank account every month. So I don't count that. Like the money's gone, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the time's gone. So we're not looking at our hours in the day. We're just putting our head down like a football player and rushing through the day. And where people get confused is they often think they have a plan, but they have a goal. Right. And and the to-do list is so damaging. And and I had someone just last week reach out to me. So, oh my gosh, I read the book and I started implementing things. And she said, I just thought you were like crazy. How could you not have a to-do list? But she said, now I can see already what a relief that is, because really what a to-do list is extra pieces that have nowhere to go. So they're not actionable items. It's very equivalent to if you built a chair from Ikea and you got a bunch of nuts and bolts left on the floor. You're like, oh, those are supposed to go somewhere. Like that looks like a problem. So the to-do list is really leftover and there's no way of looking at it as far as, you know, when you're off course or, I mean, think about this. If you were going to drive from say New York to California and you plug that in to your GPS, it would tell you when you're going to arrive, how many miles an hour you have to go, the whole thing. When you're any second, you're off the course, it would let you know really quickly. There's all that stuff. But a to-do list would be, you need gas money, we need snacks, uh, you know, extra clothes in case it gets cold. That would be the to-do list for the trip. So people falsely think that when I start talking about your calendar, that I'm going to implement this heavy structure in there. No, we're just going to change some of your habits that unfortunately work against you. And we've never really been taught otherwise. And so you just didn't really examine it. You always think the external force is the problem. Like I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. And so you just try to go faster and Clearly, you know, by now that doesn't work. I mean, that's the type of client that I work with. They always whisper to me like, oh, Chris, I go really fast and others can't keep up. And they think they're special. But I hear that all the time because that's what they're relying on. They're relying on speed and they don't have a plan. They're just trying to drive faster, like without a GPS. I'll just drive quicker, even though I don't know where I'm going, but hopefully I'll land, you know, where I want to be. And that's just that's not a plan. It makes me think of a paper route. What do you want to do is make sure the papers all get delivered where they're supposed to be delivered, not that they all get delivered faster, right? Right. The efficiency is not really the the key there. So it's almost like, you know, driving past in a car and just chucking it out on the lawn where it gets wet and then complaints happen. That's not quality work. Whereas if as long as you get up early enough and you drive around or walk or, or sorry, if you ride your bike and you make sure you you know, practice your arm and you get it up on their their front deck where it's under the eave. So it's not going to get wet and and all of that. And you can master whatever that workflow is. Then then there you go. Uh, instead of <laughs> plowing through and just doing a, a crappy job, it's not, you know, faster doesn't mean quality work in this place in the, in this sense. Efficient does not mean effective in the in that no. instance. You're absolutely right. And I would like to sort of leverage that bicycle example is because a lot of the people I work with are successful, but they want to be more successful. They have these projects on the side and like, okay, my business is going, but I want to get this whatever podcast out, book out, item for my clients, this new service. And what happens is they kind of like, I don't, you know, I get a lot done. But they want to be more successful. And there's an easier way of doing this, because what I would say to you is recently I was bicycling and I was going up this hill and I realized, you know, by what gear I'm in depends how easy the hill is. So I will get up that hill because I have to get home. So my clients will achieve whatever they want to achieve. But at what cost? Depending what gear I'm in depends how much energy I have left for the next hill and how easy the ride is. So I know the people I work with will get it done heck or high water, but at what cost to them, their life, their business? Does it have to be that hard? No. 
you were talking about the calendar being the map, uh, I believe, <laughs> unless I'm mistaken. Yeah. You were talking yeah. about, you know, taking a trip and the calendar is basically a map. And I think without explicitly saying so, the to do list, as you were talking about it, is your packing list. Yeah, I mean, there are areas people think what a to do list should be is. You might say, here's a process. So right before I come on this podcast, I have a process. There are items on that list to make sure that, you know, my phone is on mute and this or that. So I check off that process. So it's not, you know, there are actionable items within that process. But when you are generating your workflow off a to-do list, that has problems like that literally I could write another whole book on. I mean, there's all kinds of studies to show also how the brain operates. And then you're going in different directions with the to-do list. You don't have them in order of sequence. You don't know when you're off course. So if I had a to-do list to write my book, I'd be like, okay, write book or write outline, write book, proofread book, send it. Like there'd all be these steps that I had to get the book done. But I had a plan based on my calendar. So I did my creative work in the morning, the first thing. And I said, okay, I want it out by this time. So that meant working backwards. That's another whole philosophy we can talk about. Yes. And it was learned that, okay, I need to do five pages a day for this to book for this book to get out on time. Now, some days I thought I don't have five pages in me, but then because of my plan, I could look and say, well, if I don't have five pages in me today, I won't have 10 in me tomorrow. Whereas if you just say have book done in the next three months, you'd think, oh, I'll go stronger on Thursday or I'll just work harder. It'll be fine. But when you see the plan laid out, you see where, oh, if I go off course here by Friday, I have to write 25 pages and that's not likely. (laughs) So, you know, so you can't do it that way. So the, the big thing that most people have is they have goals and they don't plans and they don't have it on their calendar, which is which we all have the same amount of time, no matter how tall or thin or rich you are, we have the same amount of time in a day and you have to be strategic about where that time goes. And we've all been in that same place where like you with your book, we think very macro level about what needs to be done for it. We don't think we don't do the process. Even, even if we do the process, the correct way where we work backwards, where we say, okay, what's the end goal? And then we break it down, you know, backing it up by deadlines and then breaking it out into manageable pieces. This is where for me, the to-do list slash meeting the calendar being a hybrid kind of works best. I I don't use the calendar as a to-do list, but I do use calendar as a map to then make a map of what I'm doing inside of a task manager. You don't do that though. You do it differently. You're you're not even using a a to-do list per se. You're going more with the calendar. Is that correct? So what I want people like there's there's nuances here. So yeah. you do need some sort of uh, product management thing. So we happen to use Basecamp, but that that just is how we communicate on project. Like okay, three people are involved. I need the cover for this done. Who's involved? So there are at a higher level was what we're talking about right now. It's a basic fundamental. So diving deep into the mechanics of it. I love to talk about that. I'm not sure I'm going to fulfill sort of clarify everything for everyone in the, in the terms of this podcast. But what I would say is most people use their calendar is for outside sources. Like, Oh, I have to be at a meeting with another person. I have to go to the dentist. I have to do stuff for other people outside the workplace, or I have to physically be there and they don't manage their time on the calendar. Gotcha. That's the problem. And they don't even count things like email. So it's not on the calendar because they don't see it as work. So if you say, look, you can't improve what you don't measure. If you don't even know how long you are in emails every day. So if you don't know that, okay, I do emails every day at 11 and three, and it takes me 45 minutes, then you can't say, well, I'd like to get that down to a half hour because the next month I've got this really big project coming out. So you're not counting emails. You're not counting this. you're, You're not counting that. And all of a sudden, you think you have all this time that you don't. And so you're setting yourself up for failure. But more importantly, you can't tighten it up when you decide to take on that extra project. Like when I looked at my calendar and said, okay, I want this book to be out. What are we going to do? What are we going to cut back on? What are we going to move? What am I going to delegate? Because I knew what my inventory was. But when you're just looking at the ceiling, closing your eyes tightly and thinking, okay, I'm just going to work really hard. That's not a plan. That's a goal. 
Gotcha. Okay. So if I'm hearing you correctly and you correct me after I'm done here, this is what I think you're saying is that often what we will do when it comes to our calendar, which is where we hold the appointments that we have made agreements to be at. Like, for example, on my calendar, it says that I'm recording with Chris Ward today. And uh, there's two other things on the calendar that are these these hardcore you know, set in stone appointment type things. But just because there's only those three or four things for today doesn't mean I'm only doing three or four things today and that there is a lack of, um, let's say, time accountability on my calendar. Uh, That's where then you're saying people go crazy and think, oh, well, I've got the entire rest of the day to do whatever is whatever it is I want to do. Because I only have to do these three or four things that are on my calendar. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So what happens is the most successful people in the world will say to you, you can tell a lot by looking at somebody's calendar. Like that's just, you know, quick looking under the hood. They can tell a lot by the company just by looking at the calendar. So a lot of people make that mistake and say, oh, today's a free day because they don't have any appointments with people outside the business. But what happens is also you then only are dealing with whatever you decide to deal with today or things fall off the plan and all of a sudden they repopulate when it becomes an emergency because you don't have a bigger global plan for the week or the month. So you're just like, oh, so-and-so emailed me about this. I got to get on that. And then you do a sharp left because you have to get something else. So you are just reacting to whatever lands in your lap because you are not planning your time. And when I say that, I don't talk about heavy infrastructures. And these are very basic basic principles you'll get in the book. It's not a new system that you're like, oh, if I had time to put all that in my calendar, then I would have had time to do this work. So Mm -hmm. it's very simple strategies. But what you're telling me is you've admitted you have me on your calendar because it's outside force. You don't have your work on the calendar. No. And that's and that's and see. And then I'm going to say this. I don't think there's any perfect right or wrong answer to this. My calendar doesn't have my work on it, but that's because my task manager has my calendar items in it sitting there as well as the things that I have decided what I'm doing for this day. And it's also planned out for other days as well. And some of those things that are on here are things that have been planned out in advance based on, again, like the book or writing the book or whatever project, they're project-based tasks they're, that I've planned, pre-planned ahead of time. But I think it sounds like to me, you have a list of inventory of things you want and need to do, but they're, if they're not connected to time, that's the fundamental mistake that a lot of people make because you have all these tools and you've got all these lists and they may be very sophisticated lists and you may have strategies in place, but at the end of the day, The sun rises and sets based on time Mm -hmm. and, you know, you age based on time. So you may have a really great system, but until you tie it effectively into time, then that's going to be the one piece of the equation that's always going to throw you off. Okay, so let's go there then. How does somebody who is working with a calendar and a task list and is delegating to others and or being delegated to tie things into time? Well, you have to look at realistically. I mean, so there's a lot of mechanics in here that I'd sort of need to understand. I mean, if I was working with you, sure. you know, if you were in a group, I could look at this and say, okay, <laughs> great, great. You've got some strengths over here. And that's the kind of people I work with, you know, people like yourself that do produce at a certain level of success. And it's just that you could produce more in less time and have more free time off. So I deal with people that have a lot of strengths and it's just like, oh, they've been over here really efficient. And now I show them like, but you're not tying this into time. So you've got this sophisticated software that says, okay, I'm doing this podcast. I want so many shows a year. I want to reach this level of audience, blah, blah, blah. And you've got all the steps to do that. But, you know, in what order do they go? And do we know that they take an hour of your day or or do they take four hours a month? Do we do batch work? If we don't have it tied to time, then Uh, we can't prove it. Okay. So then this is where a, a, actually, I think it's either next week or the week after, uh, Mm -hmm. because this conversation will drop fairly quickly. I have an episode where I talk with David Allen of Mm -hmm. getting things done again. So glad to have him back. And he and I get into this a little bit where we talk about the weekly review 
as well as even going further out than that and how the capturing of ideas, how the uh, the mind sweep works. And that is a missing component in all that I described to you that, that really is missing from a lot of people's lives is the taking <laughs> the ironically, the taking of time to then think about your time and organize what it is you're doing. All those little like you, you gave the example of email taking half hour, 45 minutes. I'm guaranteeing you 45 minutes is probably a small number for most people when it comes to yeah. email for the day. And it doesn't need to take that long, but I'm not going to go into that right now. But that's just one example of a a task that expands to fill the time you allow it to have. Yes. And so that's exactly it is worse than that is those people don't know how much time they're spending on emails. That's the biggest problem. And yes, I'm, I'm taught the mighty David Allen. My <laughs> gosh, you know, that's all about him for a second, but his, all these wonderful systems that he has in place or other people that is part of the process. And that sometimes can be very limiting because people who are very organized or are list builders and think, okay, I just need to get more organized and do this. But until you take those structures and implement them in the most basic thing we all learned in grade one is from nine to 10, I do this from 10 to 11, then you don't know at the end of the day, like the GPS you, you know, the moment you're off course, but when you have a project that you want to get out and it's a, a significant project because it's bigger, you just dive in enthusiastically and try to go as fast as you can. But until you map it out in your calendar and say, okay, I, I can't, you know, I can't write a book in a weekend. I can't anyways. And I can't write it effectively because your, your creative juices just diminish. So then when I had it, you know, five pages a day, I could see when I was off course, I will know for the next book that's coming out, how to do this better. And I could see that five pages a day were realistic. And so I can, because it's tied to time, your calendar is your time bank account and everybody's buying into these softwares and all these complicated systems. But until you tie it to time, you're just going to be spinning around. That's the deal. One of the many different F words that you use <laughs> in the book, uh, you know, the, the focus is one of them. Uh, forget is one of them. Forgive. You say that forgiving is the ultimate time management tool. And I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, here's an example. When I was younger, my aunt used to give me like 50 bucks for my birthday. And I eventually had to tell her to stop because she would give me 50 bucks for my birthday. And I was younger and I had some money coming in. I had a job, but I wasn't keeping track of my finances. I didn't have a lot of bills. So I would look at something and say, oh, my aunt gave me 50 bucks for my birthday. I'm going to buy that top because you know what? I got 50 bucks for my birthday. And then I'd see a book. Oh, you know what? My aunt gave me 50 bucks for my birthday. I'm going to get that book because it's my birthday. And suddenly I realized I spent $200 because this woman gave me 50 bucks, right? <laughs> <Because> <laughs> Because I wasn't keeping track of it, right? And I was just like being generous with my money. And, and that's what people do with their time. Because you don't track it, you don't know where it's going. You don't know how long these projects are taking you. So you also don't know when you put a lot of heart and time and money into a project and it didn't pay off because you don't know how much it cost you to create it. But I will tell you, again, the people that I work with are similar to yourself where they do produce at a very efficient level, but they could be doing more if they start to track their time. And when I say that, it's not complicated. It's not start doing like, you know, every little thing that we write down and it's very tedious. And now it's a whole new thing. It's very simple practices. We talk about it in the book and it really just allows you to understand you can have these magnificent technology systems with all your infrastructures and lists and all that wonderful reorganizing of it. But until it's taught, like we, the world operates on time, you are aging. We are all aging. It's based on time. So until you make it fundamentally tied to time, you're you're just working harder than you need to. Well, and a little bit of time tracking, in my experience, goes a really long way towards awareness of what it is you're spending your time on and how much of your time you're spending on it for you to then be able to change course and or uh, retool, reorganize, rethink through whether you should even be the one doing some of the stuff that you're doing for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the, maybe here's a better example. I was in line uh, in the airport to get on a plane and the people ahead of me were asking somebody, they're saying, you know, how I think it was New York and L.A. again. And I think they were saying, 
you know, how long does it take you to get from there? And the and the other couple had said, you know what? I don't know. I've never had a direct flight. Sometimes we stop here. Sometimes we stop there. Sometimes we stop for an hour. Sometimes we stop for two. So she, she said, we've made the trip many times, but we don't know how long it would take to go there directly because of all the different routes they took and the layovers and the time of year and all that stuff. So it's a very simple question. How long does it take you to get A to B? And they've done that trip many times. But because of all the sidestepping, they don't know. And that's what most people do with their business is, yeah, I have an idea, but usually that idea is generous in your mind. And because you're doing all these sidebar projects at the same time and answering emails and juggling and reprioritizing whatever the new emergency is, you are misinformed about the work you're getting out. If they were to sit down and just think for a second. Well, it took us about this much one time. And again, this could, these could be guesses, but they're based on experience. So you correlate the different experiences together of however many trips from New York to LA and vice versa. And you say, well, we went the one time it was here to here and that took however many, or it felt like at least this yeah. much. I mean, at least getting somewhere to begin with, with the, the thought process. And then you start to write it down and you're like, okay, so on average, I think it took this much. Okay. Well, that means, you know, <laughs> we've got a better understanding now to be able to start to uh, make better decisions. By no means am I saying this is a great exhaustive decision-making process here. I'm using them as an example of even just a little bit of thought starts to go a long way when you try. And again, going back to the project of, of a book and trying to insert that then into a calendar, because I know there's a lot of the audience who feels stuck, not just not getting stuff done every day or every week that they are being delegated to, but then their own stuff that they want to do but can't seem to quite fit it in without sacrificing margin. This is where I think the the word, the other F, one of the other F words that you use, forget, comes in. Yeah, and these are all good points. I mean, here's an example. I think it was like last week, one day I had an issue with my cell phone and I had to call Apple. And when it was all said and done, it took like 45 minutes. And I was like, okay. Now, the old me, what I would have done is in a hysterical fashion, try to rush through the day and make up for that lost time because the day was busy and go, go, go. And I would have stressed everyone out around me. That was a, a system I used for a number of years, whether it worked or not. And so what I did last week was, OK, I looked at my calendar and said, OK, I lost an hour. All right. What can come off my plate today and just move? Oh, this can move to here. And then I'll move out to Thursday and Thursday thing to next Tuesday. We're good. And then I proceeded with my day because I am human. And so because I was calm it, my work level and production level was still the same. Whereas in the old days, I would have been all stressed out trying to catch up and that would have decreased my productivity and I would have made mistakes. And, you know, you're rushing up the door, you knock over your coffee, you drop your keys because you're all, you know, spinning out of control. So there's a whole aspect to how the brain receives information and the clarity and the calm that also you're giving away when you don't have an efficient map for your day. So again, it's really about if you can win the hour, you can win the day. If you win one hour, that gives you room to win two. It's very simple formulas. And we make it so complicated in this technology. And we're just looking for better and better tools. But until you have a basic successful blueprint, the tools are not going to save you. See, and I'm thinking of this even on a, not just a micro level of, calling Apple and having that take time out. So then what can I now remove from my plate or move to a different point in time uh, the next day or something like that? I'm thinking macro level, you know, like when it comes to projects, again, we're fi figuring out when you're going to write that book, for example. Well, yeah. it's seasonal. Like if, if, if you know right now, like I know right now, my, my kids just went back to school. I was at a soccer game yesterday. That was not something I did all summer or all spring. And I know there's another one coming up and it's those things that I know because the kids being in school and needing to be at certain places as well as be, me being at certain places for them is now this thing that I can't like just say, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I don't have a choice, a whole lot of choice. I, I want to be there as well as I enjoy being there. Yeah. That This is not the time to start something right now. Right. Not right. It's not the time to, I should say, add additional things in. However, taking a look and saying, well, in the future, when those things aren't there, maybe there's room and or maybe there's other places where I can find more room 
by removing things, or I should better say, forget things. Yeah. And that's absolutely it. And we often refer to our personal life and say that, like, I know this is a busy time of the year for my family, so I won't do this. But we don't, but because what's happened is those forces, the calendar, the school calendar, all those things, your kid's soccer team is tied to a time and to a calendar. And we don't transfer that into our business. So we don't say, oh, well, in October, we tend to get an influx of clients who want this type of thing because it's year end, blah, blah, blah. So we don't have the same credentials or landmarks that we have as far as knowing our calendar inside out. We think we have it in our head, but we're always generous with that. But those things that you talk about, again, are because you are tied to significant, you know, things that are on your calendar, kids going back to school, a soccer tournament, all that stuff. Those, you know, are taking up time. And so I, I, I challenge people to be as honest and sincere about blocking their work the calendar is not just for outside appointments because you you're right. You have three things on your calendar today. I am certain that today you're just not working three hours. No, in fact, I've already done way more than that. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you so you see there the problem with the math, like two plus two cannot be 12. No, exactly. And and again, that's why I kind of use, gosh, and I'm, I'm trying to describe it, but, uh, you know, I, I would falter without showing somebody personally how the system, the the time tracking, not the time tracking, but that's something we should get to in a second. Um, the calendar slash task list hybrid that I'm doing uh, accounts for that. So, and, and partly it's because then I, you know, some people know when I'm interruptible or not. Yeah, is another yeah. aspect of why the calendar doesn't have every single, you know, it doesn't have a block for email written there because they don't need to know that. They just need to know when I am or am not interruptible, et cetera. I, I just mentioned time tracking. This is something, like we said, uh, as people can get into it, it, it gets you a lot of, it shakes things loose. It helps you <laughs> have greater awareness. It helps you start to become potentially more organized once you know what you're actually dealing with, you know, pulling everything out of the closet to then put it back yeah. in and maybe not yeah. put all the things back in. Cause it was like, wait, yeah. how'd that get in there? Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. So That's how would exactly. you suggest, uh, how would you suggest people start to go about doing that? I would say, you know what, you start simple. And again, I, I'm not pushing the book because I wrote it. Uh, I, I do get people reaching out to me every day saying, oh my gosh, they just got a sense of relief. And that's all I'm looking for is for people to have an easier time of it. So what I would say though, is aside from reading the book, start simple and just start saying, okay, be realistic. Like, yeah, you do emails every day and just start tomorrow and put some as much as you can down. Don't, I mean, don't sit down and try to do the whole week. Just start off simple and say, all right, let's be realistic. So I have these two appointments, excuse me, on my calendar, but what are the things I need to get done tomorrow? And you will really quickly be shocked of, oh, there is only like, I ran out of blocks. If I gave it one hour blocks, I ran out of blocks in my calendar. What does that mean? I ran out of time. I can't block this till 10 o'clock at night. So when you start seeing, it's almost like a a very simple puzzle for a, a toddler. When you start seeing how these blocks fill up the calendar, you're like, well, no wonder I was like, I was astounded because successful people, they really do feel, and I'm talking about the industry leaders of the world. They really do feel it's not what you do with your day. It's what you do with your hour. And, and when you start laying hour by hour out, you go, Oh, wow. Like it's very enlightening. And when you do that, if you start tomorrow, we haven't even dived into focus and that's a whole nother thing, then shut everything down pick an hour. I'd love it to be the first hour. Do something creative, set your timer for one hour and try not to be interrupted and give it your all. You would be shocked when you are all in the zone, what you can do in an hour if you're doing one thing, because that multitasking, I mean, that's just a big hot mess. I thought that it Mm. totally impact me because I love my business. I had, I could do so many things at once because I was hungry and I cared, but that would mean that my brain operates differently than the rest of humanity because studies have shown repeatedly how, you know, it takes longer to do a task. You make more mistakes. Your productivity decreases 40%. So pick, start simple, pick an hour, focus, shut everything down, give it your best. And then you're going to be hungry for the, to do that two hours the next day. So we're not talking anything uh, very heavy. We're just talking about getting some success, which will really inspire you and give you room to have more success. 
we talked about focus. Obviously, that's one of the topics that comes up on this show all the time. I'm curious if uh, you have any other other than what you just described, where you're you're basically saying set out an hour, you know, and I've got my favorite tool to to do with that. It's the what is it called? It's called uh, Brain FM. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you tried that before? Yes. Remember, I said to you, you're the only person in the world that would have talked me into. I, I live by <laughs> that's it. That's right. And I was like, your show is so good. Nobody else could have talked me into that. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, it's one of those things where, I, I mean, it's so good. I was using a different product for that same thing, although this does much more than that other one used to, because I'll use it for its getting focused as well as, you know, using it for uh, relaxing or sleep yeah. or naps and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Brain FM is is amazing. I, that That's one of the things where, you know, doing that first in the day. And getting into that zone and knocking uh, specific set focused things out while using uh, Brain FM uh, just makes a huge difference. So I guess I would say that's my tip there is everybody should go try Brain FM and you can try it and get 20% off your first year by going to beyond the to do list dot com slash Brain FM. Wasn't even planning on mentioning that. So anyways, um, other than that type of focus, what are other ways that people can get, you know, to knock out the distractions? Is it is it to set up, uh, you know, from coworkers? Because coworkers are sometimes happy distractions, especially if they have just a quick question. But, uh, you know, you put a put a sign up that says don't interrupt me while I'm you know doing this right now. Other things like that. You know, that's a great question. And what I would say to you, first of all, when we talk about tools, Brain FM is wonderful and I love it, but that is a luxury. You don't need that. And that would be a happy distraction. Say, oh, I got to go get that first before I can do what Chris said. What I would tell you is my fundamental belief is any tool that's going to improve your work in any way is either free or next to free. And it's something that you can implement immediately. So I would say use a timer on your phone, set it for one hour, do your focus and just get some success there. Now, having said that, you are a capable person. You've accomplished a lot. And by you, I speak to the general you, you are self-included, of course. You can manage your time. What happens is we've been set up with these bad habits and, you know, happy distractions. So I have had clients say to me, you know, once they start doing this and the adrenaline rush of, is gone of uh, always reacting and rushing and, you know, they catch themselves like, okay, I'm focusing on this. This has to be done. And then you think, well, I've done really well for a half hour. Let me check my email and see if there's some stimuli there. So we've you know, the calmness and clarity you will get accustomed to, but we're all running off stimuli and adrenaline. So that's a a habit you have to undo. And even when you get success and my clients tell me this, like, oh my gosh, you're right. I was so much more productive this week, but I will admit a couple of times I looked for distractions. Like, oh, it's almost like if you're on a diet and you go to somebody's house and it's like their birthday and you think, well, I have to have cake. It's her birthday. That's not my fault. Right. (laughs) You know, so you, so you welcome these, you know, you, you're setting yourself up. So I would say you could definitely put your head down for an hour, turn your phone off or say, no, I've got kids. Okay. Then, then you qualify who gets through on the texting and stuff like that. Shut off the notifications. We've got notifications for everything from drink a glass of water to your emails coming in. So there, I think the problem with focus is you don't realize how many things are distracting you because you're, you're not even hearing the noise anymore. Mm. Yeah, we're so used to the hum that we yeah. just don't realize it's there. No, I had one guy call me and he wanted to work with me and we had this whole Zoom appointment and I look and he's on a, a Zoom call looking at me and looking at the traffic because he's driving. And I said, oh, my God, we can't do this. We cannot have a conversation about multitasking while you drive. And he said, oh, well, the traffic's slow. And if this isn't really multitasking, I'm, I'm, and I'm like, so that was the problem. He didn't even see it as multitasking. Like, no, we can, this, we're shutting this down. First of all, dangers aside, I don't have your attention, right? This is ridiculous. So, But that's the problem is there's so much happening. You're not even counting the multitasking. So it's really bringing it down to the basics. And that's what we walk you through in the book. I know this is the first book in a series. Where do you see the series going next? 
Well, I see the next book diving a dip a bit deeper into systems because that sounds like such a heavy word and people mm-hmm. think it's another labor intensive thing. And what happens is once you start managing your own time effectively, because you cannot manage somebody else's time if you can't manage your own. And that's where you get into people think, oh, I just need to hire a new staff. And then that doesn't work out because because you're not set up and they're there a few days and they start asking, well, what's this password? You're like, oh, that's the password for this, except on Tuesdays. And you realize you don't have any system in place that you're following. You're just rushing and reacting. So when you start to be able to navigate effectively through your projects and your time in a linear fashion and, and guarantee your results, that's when you can afford to bring in support staff uh, regardless of your budget or, or or your time. There's a whole bunch of really economical ways of doing that. Really, I would say nobody There's nobody that can't afford some support staff in these days with all the outsourcing and stuff. But you have to be able to transfer the work in a very simplistic manner or just becomes the the tail wagging dog. So that's where we're going to dive deeper because really time management is just the tip of the iceberg. It's underneath the mountain, the systems that allow you really to leverage your business. That sounds great. Well, I'm sure we'll be talking to you about that next book and the systems and building that structure soon. Uh, Of course, you have to write the book first and have it out. But uh, (laughs) that's what we talked about kind of process in this conversation. So uh, but in the meantime, I'd love for you to point people to where is best for them to grab the book uh, for you. Yeah, we are on Amazon. You can get a quick digital download. That's I always tell people that's, you know, get on it right away. Um, as well in the book, there's a whole bunch of giveaways. So that's another good reason to have the, the digital version for your, your Kindle or whatever off of Amazon. You can check us out at when the hour, when the day dot com or reach out to me on Instagram, the Chris Ward or at LinkedIn and let me know, you know, that you heard me on this great show and what you got from it. I, I would love the feedback. Awesome. Chris. Great talking with you. I can't wait to have you back on the show soon. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Well, that's another podcast episode crossed off your podcast listening to-do list. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Chris Ward. I was sure glad to talk to her. And honestly, we got into the weeds a little bit with time management and task lists, task management apps, the calendar hybrid system that I use. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have your thought processes jumbled. As I listened back through the episode, I caught some more stuff in there. So, you know, this is one of those episodes where I think as I was listening back through the episode, I caught more that made me think a second time or two through. So I hope that you do that as well. I know that I took a lot from this conversation with Chris and not only, you know, lived it the first time, but listened back through it again. And maybe you could do the same. Either way, there's probably somebody else you know who needs to hear this episode. So if you would do me a favor and them a favor by sharing this episode with them, that would be awesome. Well, I will give you back to the rest of your day so you can go be more productive. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next episode.